Are you all sitting comfortably? <laughs> Good. Hello, my name is Chris Keating. I am from Wikimedia UK and I am your host for this final afternoon session. Welcome to the far flung reaches of the Barbican to Auditorium 2. Here we're going to have the session that is down on the programmer's technology 5. If that's not what you were here for, then please go away. <laughs> no, please stay, because it will be awesome. Um, possibly. So... <laughs> It'll come back. It's fine. Um, so... We have three sessions. Firstly, we have the Wikimedia Foundation fundraising team explaining how they raise vast sums of money and why Jimmy's face no longer stares at you from Wikipedia pages once a year. 
Then we'll have Peter Gallert uh, starting at 5 p.m. Um, talking about no original research and how everybody ignores it. Then at uh, five, <coughs> then after that, we will have Christoph Henner from Wikimedia France talking about disasters, doom, failures, and awfulness and how to get past it. So I would like to welcome now the Wikimedia Foundation fundraising team. Hello, can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Um, so thank you for coming to the session. This is Honey. She's our, I think, official mascot now of the fundraising team. Um, and uh, she obviously is, is guarding all of the money there. <laughs> yes. Uh, so here's our team. Um, we're just part of our team. And here's a photo of some of the rest of us. We actually have a semi, Pats is looking unhappy with this photo. Um, we have a semi-distributed team. So about half of us are in San Francisco. Uh, Jessica and I are based in Paris and Peter's based here in London. So a few key facts, which you probably already know that Wikipedia is run by the Wikimedia Foundation, which is a nonprofit. Um, last year, the online fundraising team raised about $35 million from over two million donors, and our average gift was about $15. Uh, the bulk of our budget comes from readers around the world giving five, 10, 20 bucks, and it all adds up. Uh, the banners that you guys probably have seen are the banners on the top of our desktop pages, and um, I'll show you some examples of those in a bit, but we also have started experimenting with mobile fundraising campaigns as well. And we also run email campaigns to email people who have given to us in the past. We ask them once a year uh, to donate again. And we really do email them just once a year, which is actually pretty uncommon for nonprofit fundraising. Um, at the moment, the bulk of our money and our traffic is still coming from uh, our desktop banners. But we know that as our mobile traffic is increasing, it's going to become a more significant part of our budget. Um, and year to year, uh, we grow our donor uh, database. So the part, the part of our budget that comes from email um, is gonna become more significant in the coming years as well. Uh, this is just another look to, at the spread of our donations. Um, basically, the bulk of the story here is that most of our donations uh, <coughs> are under $50. So the biggest slice there is, is under $10. We have tons and tons of people giving us $3, and you'll see why when I show you our banner. <laughs> OK, so this is a day in the life. Um, this is not my personal calendar. This is a screenshot of one week of our testing calendar from the end of the year campaign. So each event there is a different A-B test um, that we put up throughout the day. and. Does everybody ha kind of have an idea of what I'm talking about when I say an A-B test? Uh, so we have these banners that go on the top of Wikipedia, and we're always trying to improve the banner to make it as easy for people to donate and as compelling for people to donate. Um, so we're always looking for something better. We put up two banners, and we can see which one gets more donations. Um, so yes, we're very fortunate to have the traffic of the number five website in that we have lots of data. We can run lots and lots of tests. Um, throughout the day, sometimes every hour, every 30 minutes, depending on what the variable is. So, so this is basically what my life looks like in December. Okay. And actually, okay, yeah, we are running a test right now. So if you're here in the UK or in the, the US, um, you'll be able to see banners at the top of, of Wikipedia. And Peter's keeping an eye on things over there, and we'll show you the results uh, later on. In the, in the presentation. Okay, so I mentioned that we have a distributed team, but during our big <coughs> campaign, we all come together in the office and take over 
a conference room and it becomes our, our boiler our boiler room, which is a space completely dedicated to focusing on rapid testing and, and optimization, um, kind of away from the everyday noise of the office. And it's really valuable to have this space to be able to focus and work. And um, here, all these little boards you see are are actually um, tests from all, or results from all of our tests. We actually printed out the results, put them on boards, kind of threw them around, uh, decorated the room with Jimmy photos, <laughs> um, different test setups, and and we put results <coughs> up on the board. It basically is just a big boiler room of spacing, space and experimentation. It's fun. We look at the results together. It's very exciting. <coughs> Okay, so the point of the story is we run lots and lots of tests, and where did all that testing get us? Okay, so I'm gonna try to sum up the last five years of testing in about five minutes, so it's gonna be kind of a quick overview, but you'll get a good idea. Okay, so a few years ago, some of you probably remember some of these banners. We went through hundreds and hundreds of, of text messages banners. Um, we asked the community to pitch in. You may have submitted one of these, I don't know. Um, and we tested tons and tons of banners, and overwhelmingly, one stood out leaps and bounds beyond the rest, and I bet you guys could guess which one. Uh, not the first one, actually. It is the third one, yes. <laughs> so please read, a personal appeal from Wikipedia founder Jimmy Wales was overwhelmingly the strongest banner, um, at least by 20, 20 times more donations than the rest. Depending on some of the other ones, it was hundreds of times more donations. So once we found this banner, we, we um, iterated through a whole bunch of different versions of this Jimmy banner. And luckily, we have a very nice founder who, who allowed us to do this and put his face all over. Um, and so happy birthday to Jimmy, if it is in fact today or yesterday. Um, so, so yeah, we, we hired some designers. We went through a whole bunch of different variations here. And we saw that adding a photo made a huge difference. Okay, so <coughs> adding, adding a photo, big, big improvement. But what do you guys think between all these different colors? Any winner? Anything that stands out? The last one. The last one, yeah. The last one. You guys like the last one? First one. The first one? Okay, actually there was not any really significant difference between any of those. Adding a photo in general made a big improvement, but between all of these, there wasn't a big difference. And so we ended up going with this plain one that kind of matched Wikipedia better, like T-shirt Jimmy, I think is what we call this banner. Um, and yeah, we kind of named the banners too. It makes it fun in the boiler room. When you're testing, you have to make bets and you're like, no, I think T-shirt Jimmy will be Amex Jimmy. Um, it kind of, <laughs> we thought that one looked like an American Express ad. Um, so it keeps it, it keeps you really engaged in the testing. But yeah, so there was no big difference between all these. We ended up picking the plain simple one um, for the campaign. So the big problem with these banners is that they don't actually get anybody to donate. This banner will get somebody who's interested in Wikipedia to click on a message to see what Jimmy has to say. And when they click on it, they get this letter with all these compelling reasons of why you should give to Wikipedia. Um, you know, they're the number five website, no advertising, nonprofit, all of that. So you don't, you actually miss that if you, if you don't click on the banner. And we know out of all of our readers, tons of people do not click on the banners. So the next year we basically pulled out the best parts from Jimmy's letter that we knew were really powerful and put them directly in the banner, which are the, this fax banner is what we called it. And these are just a few variations. We ran through you know, hundreds of, of tests over a couple of months. Um, and, and this fax banner performed about three times as, be three times as well as the Jimmy banner. Um, so, so it brought in more donations and more money, but it had the added benefit of educating all of our readers about Wikipedia and how it works. Um, so, so this was a big win for us. And yeah. Can you read what it is? Um, they're all different. I'll, you'll be able to see one better in a minute. So I'll show you a sample test. Oh, you can't really see it better. But yes, I can read it. Uh, Dear Wikipedia readers, to protect our independence, we'll never run ads. We take no government funds. We survive on donations averaging about $15. Now is the time we ask. If everyone reading this right now gave $3, our fundraiser would be done within an hour. That's why everybody gives $3. Uh, we're a small nonprofit with the cost of a top five website, servers, staff, and programs. 
Wikipedia is something special. It's like a library or a public park where you, we can all go to think and learn. If Wikipedia is useful to you, take one minute to keep it online and ad-free another year. Thank you. So a lot of those are lines straight from the Jimmy Appeal, and some of them are, are other lines that we've tested. Um, and okay, so, so that's the text. Um, so this was a banner from our, our last end of year campaign in December. And during our campaigns, we run lots of focus groups and user testing and watch people interact with their banners to figure out how we can improve them. And one comment we were getting was that people saw this banner, but then they, you know, they went to read the article, and when you scroll down, the banner goes away and they forgot. They said, oh, I meant to donate, but you know, in a way I forgot about it. So we tested <laughs> adding in this side, this little side tab. So when you scroll down the page, the banner goes away, but you get a little reminder on the side. And any guesses? Didn't do well? Um, so actually it increased donations and amount by about 15%, adding that, that little side tab on the side. Uh, so once we found that, that was a pretty big win actually. That was, a, that was a pretty big win in December. So once we found that, we iterated on a bunch of testing of that tab and, and we put that, that $3 line that we knew was pretty powerful. We said, let's see how it does in the, in the in the tab, and it brought in about 40% more donations and 20% more money. So what's happening there? A lot of people are giving three, or $3. So we're getting way more donations. Overall, we're bringing the average gift down, which is why it's only 20% more money. But overall, it's still a win. Um, it's still great. So, so we kept this one. <laughs> and, and this was a great test, too, because um, we went off of something that we knew was doing well, this side, this side tab, and let's iterate on it. And this was a really cheap test to run, just changing the text, you know, I can do that. That takes like no tech time. Um, so, so this was a, a great test from December. Uh, we go through, through lots and lots of testing. We usually end up testing one variable at a time. So we'll change, you know, the, the line of the text or we'll change a button or the color. Um, and over time, <coughs> it changes quite a bit. So here we have, our best banner from 2012 and our best banner from 2013. Um, they look sort of the same. I mean, they're slightly different colors. The message is similar. This one has a few more buttons and things, but, um, but we always want to reality check our, our results. So after we make you know, one improvement after the next, after the next, we want to see the combined effect and see, are we really helping this, this banner perform? Uh, so we ran this in December. We put the two up against each other. Anybody want to guess? 13 was better, but did anybody want to guess by how much? How much? 40%. Yes. 92%. I had 92% more donations. So really, all these small changes over and over, really the course of a year it took to change that banner, ended up with a 92% improvement. So lots of 10%, lots of 20% improvements contributed to that. Um, so I think... That's all that I'm going to do, right? Yeah, yeah that's it. So um, these are just a few examples of our desktop banners. We've, in this last year, experimented with mobile, which presents lots of challenges. And we have some very exciting test results with Peter. We'll show you. OK, so Megan's just condensed several years testing down into about 10 minutes. Um, I'm just going to focus a bit more on stuff we've been doing the past year or so. So I get to spread out a bit more. But um, basically, mobile has been a huge focus for our team recently. Uh, I'm sure you've all used mobile Wikipedia at some point. It's a huge growth area for our projects, but it's very, very difficult to do <coughs> fundraising off. I mean, it's only when you start to do something like this that you realize how small mobiles are, even though they seem to be getting bigger all the time. There's still a lot of squeezing you have to do to get things into that space. And also, people are generally less likely to donate or buy things on a mobile. The payment methods can be a bit fiddly, so we're doing a lot of work in that area as well. And as Megan said, we rely so much on our message and we have to try and cut it down to the absolute bare essentials for mobile. Um, so 
Can anyone guess which of these won? The one on the left or the one on the right? Right. Right? Anyone else? Yeah. Left? Do you think, who, hands up, who thinks left? And right? Uh, okay. Um, people on both sides? Um, yeah, it's actually the one on the left. But did you think it would be that big a difference? Yes. Is the really surprising thing. Yeah. It's the wording. It's the fact that we have that, if everyone reading this gave $3 line that we found is so powerful. <coughs> and that carries over to mobile as well. So we've also been testing things like the amounts people can give. Um, so we have, there's a trade-off here between do we want the bigger, more touchable buttons, or do we want slightly smaller buttons, but more of them? Um, anyone guess which one here? So the average for the left one was $6.77, <coughs> and the average for the right was much higher, $9.18, and it gave a 25% increase overall. So this is actually, we think, due to a fairly well-documented psychological effect called anchoring, which is if you give someone a high amount, like $100, people don't necessarily give $100, a few people might, but it raises the amount that other people give. They see that amount and think, I could stretch to a bit more. If someone's giving $100, I could give a bit more. So, yeah, that works well for us. And then more recently, I talked about cutting our message down to the bare essentials um, and trying to squeeze it into that space. Um, we've, this is actually something we've just done last week or the last couple of weeks is we've taken a new approach and we've worked with our design team and our mobile <coughs> web team and we made this banner which fills the full screen. I know, I know, it's annoying, but you'll see why in a minute. Um, and we could include the whole message, all the stuff about if everyone reading this right now gave $3, all the nice stuff that we had in the mobile, in the desktop banner, sorry, and also the amounts and the payment methods, which we find are really good to include, so people can see what they can use to donate. Um, so, can anyone guess which one won? The, the one on the right. But the thing about this is we only have to show it once. The one on the left, we show every time someone visits a page while we're doing a test. The one on the right, we only show it once and then it goes away. So it's annoying, but it's less annoying because it doesn't pop up every time you go there. And once you close it, well, <laughs> not that much. Once you close it, it goes away. And it's still 250% better than the previous one. So that's our big find from the past couple of weeks. Question? The effective wording contains two phrases. One which is, keep it online. And mm -hmm. right underneath it, please donate now. Please, but we please help people on that one. Please donate now. Do you feel that that is misleading if people are reading it quickly? They're thinking, if people don't donate enough in the next, I don't think it's I don't think it's particularly misleading. It's messaging we've been using for a long time, and um, we've talked with people in our communications department about it. And yeah, I we don't obviously we don't want to mislead people. Right. We? we definitely don't. We have our legal team approving all of our yeah. messages. So as they well. could get the wrong idea. But, but actually, they, it's true. If we had no fundraiser, which you probably it would go offline. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I mean, if we had no funding. Nobody would pay for the servers. It actually would probably go off. Um, Chris? Have you tried looking at the version on the right just with fewer words? This is brand new, so that's like the next thing we're going to do. We're guess. doing that. Next week, <laughs> actually. How do you know? Yeah, have you been snooping on our emails? Checking or our test <laughs> you. No, but that's really, guys, that's huge. Like, that is the biggest result that we've seen for mobile this whole year that we've, that we've been experimenting. So um, it was a very exciting test result last week. Sorry, I jumped in. 
Um, and that's it for banners. Can we save questions till the end now, I think? Um, that's it for banners. The other part of what we do is emails. Um, that's also a growth area, as Megan said, as we um, get more people donating, we collect their email addresses and we don't spam them. We send them a reminder email once a year, which is far less than any other charities do. Our, we use an outside contractor for email and he keeps telling us, you're weird, you don't send enough emails, you need to send more emails. And we say, no, we send them one, no, we send them one and then one if they didn't donate the first time, and then that's it. Um, so yeah, even though we don't send that many to each person, it's still about three million emails last year, and four million dollars raised, and hopefully that's going to keep increasing. And just like the banners, we always do A-B testing on them, testing things like subject lines are hugely important, the content of the email, and the amounts, and even things like the time of day that we send it, and when in the year we send it. And that's everything from me. I'm going to hand you over to Jessica. So yeah, the campaigns that we run are, it's truly a global campaign. Um, the banners that you've seen, some examples of here, well, we run them in about 50 languages. Um, we accept about 82 different currencies and we offer roughly 20 payment methods. Um, because our goal here is really to make sure that we optimize all of these parameters, right? So this means that in each country that we run our fundraiser, not only do we want to make sure that we offer the local currency, but we also want to make sure that we have the right payment methods, the most convenient and the most popular one, in that particular region that we're fundraising in. Right, so, um, and of course, we want to make sure that our banners and all the supporting pages that goes with the donation process are all translated into the, to the spoken language. Um, so, as, as both Megan and Peter have, have um, pointed out, we do a lot of A-B testing. And we A-B test basically all of these, these parameters. Um, we test a number of different versions of banners whenever we run campaigns. Um, so this means that we run a, a couple of different um, text tests um, because not only do we want to run obviously error-free messages, but we also want to make sure that the messages that we run are culturally and li linguistically, um, you know, well well put together and that they really work in that region. Um, we also A/B test payment methods to make sure that we have chosen the right ones, um, and um, we also. A-B tests the uh, amounts that we offered in the banners. Um, so it's really a lot of A-B testing that we do, which is really experimental and, and really fun. Um, and we obviously do a lot of research to uh, make sure that we understand each of the regions where we're fundraising and to kind of get ideas into what we should be doing better and to constantly improving the, no the donation experience. Um, I'm sorry. I'm yeah, um, and our fundraising campaign has gone from something that was much more <laughs> focused on the end of the year campaign um, to a model where we now spread out the campaign all over, all over through the year. Um, and we divide the year into regional and language sections. Um, so this calendar year, for example, we started off in Europe. And we tested um, in Poland, we tested in Spain, we tested in Czech Republic. Um, in a bunch of different countries um, in Scandinavia. Um, and this really allows us to go more in depth and get a better understanding of all of these different markets and what we can improve in the specific regions we're testing. Um, but it also, um, by spreading out the campaign this way that we now do it, we, we're also not um, missing out on people who might um, want to donate to, to the foundation but didn't see a banner, for example, at the, at the end of the year. So that gives them a chance to donate throughout the year. Um, and our objective is always to limit the number of times that people see our banners. Um, because we obviously don't want to uh, annoy users um, on the site, but we still have to reach our, our budget goals. Um, so how do we do that? Well, we use cookies. Um, we constantly experiment with cookies to make sure that um, the fundraising is really as effective as possible. And um, 
to give you some insight as to how this fundraising process works, um, as Megan briefly mentioned, we are currently running a test here in the UK, and it's also running in the US. So if you're on your desktop, you can actually see how many people are actually on the desktop right now, but if you are, um, you can go on Wikipedia and um, on the English Wikipedia, and um, you, have, you cannot be logged in, but you would be able to see the banners um, that we're currently running. Um, and these are the banners that we're currently running. Let me just show you what they look like. Okay, that's not showing really well. What? Wow. It doesn't look like that. No, it's not looking like that. So how can I make this look smaller, I guess? Not really, right? Okay. Hmm. Maybe show Peter, how can I do the full screen here without... Okay. Press F11. Okay. Or if we just show the screenshots in the slides, maybe it'll be Sorry, yeah, and we're going to have to do that, actually. Um, we do have the same, actually, a different system here where it actually slides when you scroll down the page. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not making you see that properly. <coughs> um, but yes, here it's. These are where the two banners look like basically on the page. So the text is actually the same one that Megan read earlier. Uh, to protect her independence, we'll never run ads. We'll take no government funds. We survive on donations averaging about um, 10 pounds. Uh, now is the time we ask if everyone reading this right now gave three pounds, our fundraiser would be done within an hour. We're a small nonprofit with costs of a tough boy website, server, staff, and programs. Wikipedia is something special. It's like a library or a public park where we can all grow to think and learn. If Wikipedia is useful to you, take one minute to keep it online and add free another year. Thank you. And in the next version, uh, we're basically, um, we just added a line which says, um, after the, now is the time we ask, it says, if everyone reading this right now gave um, three pounds or fundraiser would be done within an hour, yep, that's about the price of buying a programmer a coffee. This but is the maybe. only two differences between these two versions. And let's take bets. Everyone raise their hands who think that version A is going to win this test. Not that many, okay. So version B, guess it's the rest of you guys. Okay. So that's what happened. <laughs> this is actually right right now. So we got two and a half thousand donations on version A and three thousand donations on version B. So yes. Congratulations, those who you voted for version B. It wow. seems to be the, the best one. Um, <laughs> That's a good way to cheat. Yeah. Um, just to keep it clear, though, that this is not the process that we use to then come up with exactly. We don't just look at this and go, okay, we're going to go for number B, version B. We have a number of statistical tools that we use and really to analyze the results and get a better understanding of exactly what happened. Um, and, and yeah, unfortunately, we're a little bit running out of time, so I won't have, yes. Uh, do, you okay. also, uh, do you also take in mind uh, what are the words that are at the middle of the page? Because in the version A, there is, it means if you just skim through it without reading it, you see top five and, you know, another year. And in version yes. B, it's not. So you keep all that also? Of course, yes. And we always try to test only one variable, which is always not only always possible, but we always try to limit the number of variables we have in two different banners to make sure that we know what is that actually making a difference. So yeah, this is um, this was a, a live test. So what's the future for us? Um, we obviously want to improve the donation experience um, all the time. That's what we're working hard to do, especially on mobile, as Peter mentioned. Um, we always want to add, uh, constantly working on adding more payment <coughs> methods, more languages, um, and this is a time that I would like to take the opportunity for you to encourage you to be part of the, of the fundraising process as well. Because the same way that you can be uh, helping us uh, and working on improving Wikipedia, you can also contribute to making our banners better. Uh, and the one very good way to do this is to be part of our translation sprint because we are always in need of help um, from community members 
um, to translate banner messages and overall just give us feedback on what do you think, uh, what works, what doesn't in certain languages and so on. So um, please be come to the translation sprint that we're running together with the language engineering team on Sunday at 9.30 a.m. So I hope to see you there. And yes, please be, um, you know, come, come to us with every t on all type of feedback that you have um, regarding the fundraiser, regarding the messages, what you're seeing, what we think can improve. Uh, we're always happy to hear from you. So, yeah. Thank you. I think we're pretty tight on questions. Do we uh, still? Yeah. We're done. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Oh, um, we have downstairs where all the booths are, there's a booth for the shop. Right. Uh, so, come check out the shirts, the sweaters, the pins and all that, and I'll be there after this session if you have any questions as well. Please come see us. Yes. And please go to Jessica and Peter's session on Sunday morning. It's 9.30, which is very early, but Wikimania is like Christmas. It's once a year. It'll be and you can it. sleep <laughs> next, next week. Sleep next week. And please go help out. It's really fun and interesting to see your words at the top. And, and then you'll message. see the results when we talk. And we'll show the results. So. It's really, really fun. So please, please help her and thank you. Thank oh. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, now I'd like to welcome Peter Gallert, who's come to Wikimania all the way from Namibia. Um, his talk is about no original research and how everybody fakes it all the time which I'm looking forward to hearing. Thank you so much. Oh, this is quite sophisticated equipment here. You don't even have to stick to the microphone. That's very good. Um, Okay, thank you very much. Uh, you can all hear me if I'm speaking like this. I'm not kind of destroying your ears, it's very good. Uh, my computer is, oh yeah, well, se centuries old and, and will take some time to reboot, so I'll, I'll, I'll have half a minute or so to introduce something without my slides. At first, I'm terribly sorry if you maybe expected something different because it is the slot on technology, it is headed experimentation and what I'm going to talk about has got nothing at all to do with technology and nothing at all with experimentation, unfortunately. I don't know how I ended up at this slot, but uh, probably they wanted me furthest away from uh, <laughs> from the general proceedings, which I can understand to a, certain amount, uh, to a certain degree. So what I'll be looking at, you see the title is pretty specific because I didn't want to lure anybody into this room uh, with wrong expectations. So I, I have to concentrate on one particular policy on the English Wikipedia, and I, I will make a few remarks on German Wikipedia. Are there editors to German Wikipedia in the room? Yeah, a few, okay. Uh, I'll, I'll largely speculate on what's happening on, on DE, uh, but I think I have an idea. And, and, uh, but it might be, if you're coming from some language, it, it might unfortunately be that what I have to say here is absolutely not relevant to you, then I apologize in advance. <coughs> All right, computer's still booting, but I think uh, I can start opening that. It's very slow. Um, okay, so what was the idea for that particular talk? Uh, the idea, the idea developed from uh, what I called two years back, not at this venue, somewhere else. I called it the uh, I called it the Catch Twenty Two of of uh, of Wikipedia. We have we have a group of policies which you cannot all adhere to. It's impossible. So those are original, no original research plagiarism and a few other things uh, in that in that area um, and I'll show you in a moment you might not believe me but I'll show you in a moment why that is so and then I had then I thought like uh, 
behavior. It's not working. Then I thought like, like, uh, thought like, well, let's look a little bit deeper into it and let's try to analyze it. What exactly is the problem? Why? Uh, I'm not the only one believing that. You will see that that uh, I've kind of sprinkled a few a few quotes uh, on the top of my pages here. Um, then I thought, well, let's let's try to analyze it on a very analytical level. So I'm, I'm today I'm on a very high abstraction level. Um, that's why I put here philosophy on my badge. That's that's pretty much all that I'll be doing. I go through a few of the claims that we are making on English Wikipedia, and I try to kind of take it apart and say, well, is that actually true? Are we doing that? So what I'm going to do is first I I tell you where I want to get at. I have a few theses. Uh, then I'll go through the terminology and then I'll look specifically uh, at the original research policy on English Wikipedia. So I'll start with the beginning, of course. I have the following thesis. I, I believe that Wikipedia is the 21st century bibliography, outline and ultimately definition of knowledge. Uh, bibliography means, you know, uh, a description of all valuable sources of a certain area of investigation. And we achieve that, I believe, by uh, asking that every article is, is referenced. And by that, we have a huge set of references that at some point in time have been deemed acceptable. And that itself is, is, is quite a task. Um, which is actually exclusively research. Writing a bibliography is a research task. And that's what brings me to my second uh, thesis, that Wikipedia, writing Wikipedia, is almost exclusively a research endeavor. So what we're doing here, we're doing research. And well, then that brings me to my third thesis that a policy on no original research cannot possibly be adhered to, and in fact is not being adhered to by anybody on the English Wikipedia. All right, I'm going to start very slowly, and I'm going to with something which is maybe not too controversial, and I get more controversial as he's lifting up his reminder, uh, reminder messages of how many minutes I've got. Um, what is an encyclopedia? All right, I looked it up at my favorite encyclopedia. You might know what that is. Uh, a reference work holding a comprehensive summary of information from all branches of knowledge. Well, a reference work, well, I believe we are on our way. More and more people are looking up things on Wikipedia. I'm not gonna go into the details here. Comprehensive, well, these a recent presentation by, by, a very, by a fantastic Wikipedia editor, uh, Mr. Ingo Koll, from a German who's one of the driving forces be behind Swahili Wikipedia, working as a priest in the Islamic Republic of the Iran. Uh, this is unbelievable, and the guy is really fantastic. And he, he figured out there's 37 articles of 10,000 vital articles still missing. Unfortunately, I couldn't figure out which of those 37 uh, or which ones are the 37. Let me just, you know, before we're going too fast, let me remind you about one thing. Uh, there's one aspect of the definition of an encyclopedia, which we all forget. An encyclopedia is something complete. Before it's not complete, a classic encyclopedia, not unlike Wikipedia, would not call themselves an encyclopedia. They were just not printed yet, right? So we are kind of different. That situation that we say, well, those 10,000 articles are vital and well, 37 are still missing, uh, is actually something, one aspect where we would say, well, are we really an encyclopedia, right? And I believe we have overwhelming consensus by almost 100% of our editors that Wikipedia is not yet complete, right? And that will probably not change in the in the in the future. Um, but we should keep that in mind when we. You see, I give you the definition, and then I try to apply to uh, try to apply it to Wikipedia. Uh, I could go much more into detail, but that's a talk for another day. If we come to the third criterion, 
where we say are all branches of human knowledge, we are actually far ahead of our competitors, as witnessed by the sheer size. All right, now we are the encyclopedia that is not written by scientists. That's something that you can read very often. Well, I would say that's kind of a garden, which is not maintained by gardeners, or a conference center where the design has not been done by architects, even though it's the largest conference center in the world, and it's kind of sporting some of the most important design innovations. You see, where I want to get to is, can we define that away? Can we say, well, just because we declare it to be that way, it means we, uh, we are not scientists. I can do the definition the other way around, and I say, well, an encyclopedia is uh, a core output of research. So whoever outputs an encyclopedia is a researcher, is a scientist. And I think that is the more um, fruitful approach. Not to say, no, 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 we, we, we are writing an encyclopedia, but we are not scientists. It's not very convincing to me. So but that was the easy thing. So encyclopedia. Let's look at what research is. Again, quote from Wikipedia, the creative work undertaken on a systematic basis in order to increase the stock of knowledge. So again, we have three criteria that we need to check. Are we creative? Yes, we are. Our writing, our selection of sources, our selection of topics, the way we put them all uh, into, into the uh, comparable format, uh, that's all creative. Are we systematic? Well, not entirely, not in the, in, in the sense of uh, that we are assigning tasks to editors and we say, well, history of China is still a bit weak, can you please write that for us? We're not doing that, but we are in a way systematic by means of wiki projects, guidelines, uh, regulations, categories, portals, and so on. I don't need to uh, go into detail here, I believe. Um, that brings us to the last remaining criterion. Are we increasing the stock of knowledge? Well, at first we are the largest outline of knowledge. That is a meta criterion kind of saying, well, we basically undertake to define what knowledge is, what encyclopedicity is actually. That's what we're discussing all the time. We, at the same time, we have created the only comprehensive knowledge repository where scientific and popular aspects are combined that's not existent anywhere in the world. Yeah, you can read about the church and about who designed it and at what age and what it was used for. And should it have happened that some celebrity was married in that church, then this information would automatically be included, right? And you would have no other uh, publication where you would have the aspects from popular culture and from science right on the same page. So. In that particular way, we are creating a new way of presenting knowledge. I already mentioned bibliography. We by now possibly have created the largest bibliography of human knowledge, the largest discussion of which source is valuable, why is it valuable, and what does it contain, what kind of claims does it support. And with commons, even though, you know, all those penises and stuff, uh, we, have, we have kind of produced the largest collection of audiovisual material uh, that could theoretically be used in educational contexts, right? We, can, we don't have to use them all, we can leave some out, it's no problem, but that is one of the achievements of the, of the movement. And that's not all. Under the topic of research, I can tell you that some, some of our busiest fora are entirely research endeavors. If we are sitting there and we are discussing the notability of an article, then what, we are, what are we discussing? We are discussing its expected historic significance in relation to what we know today. Now that is a research effort, there's nothing else, right? Uh, all those notice boards on what is original research, uh, what should we delete, what should we keep, what are actually our best articles, and which ones are not, and why. 
are all those are research questions that we are answering. And even though that all happens outside article space, <coughs> the result of those discussions is what we display in our articles. If we figure out if there's consensus that this particular source is actually, you know, a publisher or a fringe opinion, that we should not include it, uh, then yes, that, that proposition is not displayed on, on the article. But the result is displayed. The source is no longer in, right? So that's why even though our articles might not be the result or might not look like research, they are the result of research. So even if we could write articles that are free of research, the way to produce them would still be research. Okay, now let me get a bit, bit closer to the topic. By the way, I mentioned already there's some quotes there, and I, I do acknowledge uh, that pretty much all of the quotes that are sprinkled on top of the pages are from editors that are by no means uncontroversial. Um, so yes, I do know that. Okay. Original research, according to Wikipedia, um, produce new knowledge rather to present the existing knowledge in a new form. Let me first state there is no article on English Wikipedia that is named original research. And it is part of the article on research and it carries two very, very flimsy sources. One, one dead link and one let me say, substandard piece of educational material. So the, the, it's, it's very, very thinly sourced. Um, and that got me to the second question. Is there anything like unoriginal research? If we say we forbid original research, then there should be something like an unoriginal research. Uh, otherwise, you know, we, we're just, we're just uh, talking tautologies here. Um, and then I looked it up, and original research as a term has 160,000 hits in Google Scholar, so I was surprised because I, that was actually not active, not part of my active vocabulary. But if you look it up, it's inevitably used in a different meaning. It's not used in the meaning that we are using it on English Wikipedia. It is used as, um, it is used as a quality a quality sign of research. So original research is research of high quality in the common meaning of the, world, of the word, except within the English editor community. That's just the story. And indeed, if, if there are a few scientists here, if you've ever gotten a review back and, and somebody told you, well, it's rather low degree of originality, that means uh, your paper's not accepted. There's nothing new in there. Um, so research is pretty much original. That's what research is. There is no unoriginal research. Otherwise, it's publication. So, which means the reason that there's no article on English Wikipedia for original research uh, is probably that it would be deleted as a, ne a neologism uh, because that word doesn't exist out outside Wikipedia. And even worse, it's a, what we call a pleonasm. It's, it's like, you know, um, uh, a tautology saying the same thing two times. The German Wikipedia, that's why I asked in the beginning whether there are Germans here, they have it much better. They, they have a better naming of that. They call it Theoriefindung, it's something like theorizing, and they forbid that. Um, and indeed, when you are reading the German Wikipedia, they allow a lot more interpretation through their editors than what's currently allowed on on the English Wikipedia. That's why the German Wikipedia is, in my opinion, a bit better readable than the English one. <laughs> All right, and the last piece of terminology, because we also have kind of a, a corollary of, of no original research, we have no synthesis. So um, is synthesis something, something outside research or, or some subset? Well, and basically the way that I know how we use synthesis outside Wikipedia is this. Um, you know, you have a research process. First you get your data, then you analyze your data, you get your results, you write it up. That's research. And synthesis is a particular way of accomplishing the first step of that. Namely, it's a question where you get your primary data from to do research with. So you can have an analysis where you gather the data yourself, whether you use 
other people's data and, and evaluate it a, a second time, or you use the secondary sources of other researchers and you treat them as primary sources for your own research, and that is synthesis. Let me just quickly dispel some myths. A speculation is a speculation, not synthesis. Uh, a speculation is also not research. It's also not original research. I already told you I believe that doesn't exist. Um, also imagine, say, even grade eight, you know, my, my neighbor's son uh, is supposed to produce uh, a research project at a government school. He's about 14 years old. If he came and said, well, my research is uh, that I want to take two different sources, two different propositions, and I want to put a but in the middle. And that is my research. Uh, I mean, you know, teacher would be looking kind of bewildered, yeah? Because that's not research according to the common usage of the world. So if it's not research, then it also can't be original research, even if it existed. Uh, and that's no synthesis. That's not what a scientist means if he says, I, make a, uh, I will have my data, data gathering, or even my entire research method in the form of a synthesis. So we are <coughs> kind of doing funny things on English Wikipedia, redefining words that already exist outside Wikipedia, and I believe to a certain degree we might, might, might make, make it difficult for, for outsiders to enter Wikipedia because they say, I don't understand that. Why do they call that research? Uh, what's that? All right, and one final terminology, editing, right? We call, the English Wikipedia calls their contributors editors, but we are not editors. The Germans, again, have it better. Um, they call their contributors authors, and that's what we are doing. The editor of an encyclopedia is the one who creates the content, right? Who reduces or expands white space, who produces category trees, uh, who rates articles. That's an editor. The one who writes it is not an editor, it's an author. So again, we are using words in a way that uh, that is not kind of recognized outside. And editing, indeed, editing an encyclopedia is not research. But those who are writing articles are not editing, they're writing. Okay, what do we want with the original research policy? You see, an encyclopedia article on Wikipedia and elsewhere structurally looks like that. We have a certain introduction, the lead, right? The introduction is normally not referenced or doesn't have to be. And then we have the core, and the core carries references. That's how we want our articles to look. Whereas a piece of research normally looks entirely opposite. Right? A classic paper would look like this. I put my introduction, I give sources in the introduction to say this is where I'm coming from, but then the core of my article is my work. So there are no, no more references there. So it looks exactly opposite and we say in Wikipedia, I believe that's why we got the original research policy in the first place, we say we don't want this. We want it the other way around. Right? Now, Another nice quote, uh, I'll give you five seconds to, to read through that. Um, current, currently, the wording of the original policy, uh, research policy is like this. We may not use any material in articles for which no reliable published sources exist. And that means, for instance, unpublished scientific results. But wait a moment, no material for which no reliable published sources exist is actually a lot, lot more. And I give you a list and I give you an example. And I swear to you, I, you, you see the cheapest thing, what? the cheapest thing that you can do to, to Wikipedia is, is, and to criticize Wikipedia is actually to take any of its articles, one of them, to tear them apart and to show what's wrong with it. Uh, that's a very cheap exercise. Uh, you will always be successful, probably even in 30 years. But I said, all right, let me be fair. Let me take an article. Let me take an article of which Wikipedia says this is one of our best featured articles. Huh? Um, and I swear, I only, I only tried one. I wanted to have a road article. 
the insiders will know, there's a couple of featured articles on roads uh, and, and highways on the English Wikipedia because it's so short, right? Because um, I have a display problem here if I, if I really go through everything. So it's working not very nicely, but a little bit. Okay, wh where is the original research? Um, I was thinking like, even in a featured article, I find original research. Okay, let's start. The map. Who designed the map? A Wikipedia editor. Or a comments editor. Actually, if you click on it, it goes to Google, but Google says, I have it from Wikipedia. All right. What original research is this? We have no reliable sources saying that this is one of the best articles on Wikipedia. No original... Oh, original research is actually this, because Interstate 296 is an unsigned highway, which means there's exactly one place in the world where there's a 296 on blue-black background with some red cover on it, because it's unsigned, you know, it doesn't have a street sign. There's only one place where this piece of graphic is, exists, and that's Wikipedia. Um, yeah. Original research is the info box. Not the information within, it's properly, properly referenced, but the selection that, that its length, its, uh, its, its, its uh, building date, and, and, and are the only important aspects of this highway. And not maybe, for instance, its surface, whether it's interlocks or tarmac or gravel or whatever. Uh, this is our judgment. We have no reliable sources for that. Um, original research is every picture. Who took that picture? Wikipedia editor. Is that Wikipedia e editor an expert in locating highways? No, isn't, right? We have no reliable source. Actually, we have no reliable source at all that what we are even seeing is Interstate 296, not least because it's an unsigned highway, right? Could be any road. Um, original research is for all other pictures. Original research is oh, original research. Uh, the selection of references. Which ones we use to write the articles are our decision. Is original research. And original research is a lot, lot more. For instance, groupings like this. Who tells you that what, what do all the unsigned extensions of, an, of another highway have in common other than being unsigned? Uh, why is that important? Original research. Okay, <coughs> so it's absolutely impossible to have something free of original research. I'll not go through all of that. I think I showed you examples from everywhere because somebody's already lifting, lifting signs here. Even worse, I may not make, according to current policy, I may not make a conclusion, a logical deduction from A and B to C. I may not do that. It's, I'm violating the original research <laughs> policy. Well, either it's a valid conclusion, then I can always draw it. Or it's an invalid conclusion, and I cannot draw it. And I have a source for that, which is a, any, any introductory logic textbook. Uh, and that's actually very funny. Um, so why can't I make a standard deduction? That's totally stupid. And now, no synthesis. We may not take source A or source B, take a, take a um, statement from A, take a statement from B, and put some, uh, some words in between. Standard example from the policy, actually, the UN wants to maintain peace, but since its creation there have been 160 wars. Why we may we not use that on Wikipedia? Because you could rewrite it with the same source material and say, the United Nations uh, wants to maintain peace and since its creation there have been only 160 wars, which seems to be the opposite of what we've been doing before. That's from the policy, I didn't invent that. Um, the story is of course, if we really have a reliable source saying that since the creation of the United Nations there have been 160 wars, uh, well, in what context did they say that? Must be either a positive context or a negative context, otherwise they wouldn't just state it like this, right? So it's a totally misplaced example. Uh, it's neither synthesis, nor is it original research. It's not research. It's either a correct interpretation of the source, 
or it's an incorrect interpretation of the source. So it's either right, right or wrong. Neither way, it's research. What happened, I don't know, I came in 2008. What happened in 2007, I don't know. Um, original research started in 2003. We don't want new theories. We don't want new ways of reading things. That's actually a Jimbo Wales quote that was in there for, for quite a number of times. We don't want novel, novel narratives or novel historical interpretations. Yes, amen, we don't want that, right. In 2007, it changed from, let me give you the abstract view, from no novel ideas to we want nothing that's not directly supported by sources. I don't know, 2007 was also the year when it apparently became more difficult to become admin on English Wikipedia. A couple of other things happened in 2007. It was one year before I came. I can't really say what it was. It has good aspects, that development. So it happened somewhere in 2007. It has very good aspects because it's very easy now to revert speculation. I don't have to show that it's wrong. I only have to show it's unsupported, which means I can revert speculation without actually being knowledgeable about the topic. Right? And that's, uh, that's a good thing that we can make speculation reversion easier. It's also a good thing that it forces us to put a lot of sources in because remember, the world's biggest bibliography. But it has bad aspects as well. Because you see, even a featured article is kind of completely and utterly full of original research. Actually, the only way, the only way to produce an article which does not contain original research according to current policy is if you have a plagiarism of one text for a topic for which only exists one text, so that you don't have the source selection problem. It is the last slide. Um, but all those good aspects are covered by other policies, and the bad aspects can, uh, the bad aspects, I think, are very substantial. And now, after this long introduction, I have one line of things what I want to do. I want to revert it back to December 2006. And I want to rename it because original research is a fantasy product of the editor community of Wikipedia, of English Wikipedia. Uh, and it's not good if we redefine terms because that makes it difficult for outsiders, newbies, professors that want to join uh, to actually understand what we are doing. Thank you very much, Peter. I'm really sorry we don't have time for questions. Um, however, let's take a straw poll. <laughs> I'm quite persuaded. So, uh, of those of you in the room, how, how many of you basically agree and would click the revert button on that particular policy? And how many think that's a terrible idea? Oh, okay, right, so. Yeah, so. <laughs> <laughs> so, so <laughs> it's uh, yeah, it 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 understood in, in, certainly in England. Yeah. I, it's, it's, the, it's the term that describes a PhD in particular. Okay, I do have to introduce the next speaker yes. now, I'm afraid. Yes, Christophe. Um, Christoph Henner from Wikimedia France is coming to talk about failure and what to do about it. No AV for this, so if we can turn off the projector, brilliant. Oh yeah, you're right in the end. Good afternoon. Yeah, good afternoon. Um, so I'm here to talk about facing failures and making drastic changes. And as a good thing for this talk, I failed preparing it, uh, meaning I thought it was tomorrow. So, starting to talk about failures with failures is a good thing, so, but I did prepare it because I made my homework. Um, so, the question is, uh, we are, so I'm not going to talk about Wikipedia as such, but more about Wikimedia and us organizations as volunteers and how we enter projects and so on. Um, in this room we all failed, I failed, I just said that, I just failed preparing my, my presentation. And 
from the past few months, years, and so on, you can read that failure is a good thing. Failure is good to happen because you have to be ready to face failures. But failure is not good. I mean, nobody likes to fail. Nobody enjoy failures. I mean, if somebody does, please raise your hand. I would love to talk to you. Um, but um, the thing is, what we call failures uh, usually are not really failures. Failures, you can say something is a failure if you have an objective. If you failed without objective, it's not a failure. It's uh, something that should have even happened. Uh, because if you don't have objective, you can assess if it's a failure or if it's not a failure. And if you don't have goals, then you will have frustration. You will, have, uh, you will not uh, have the sense of completion in the end. You will have, don't have the satisfaction of finishing things because you don't have a clear goal in the end. So if you can fail, you cannot success in the same time. Uh, so you will fail. Um, everyone will fail. And if you don't fail, it's either you're not defining goals or you're not trying hard enough, basically. Uh, so facing failure is something that is really key to um, to digest, uh, because we are culturally not wired to face failures. Uh, we are wired to be ashamed of failures, to diminish ourselves when we fail. When you, got that, when you get at school and you have the, I'm sorry, I'm using the French rating system, but uh, four points over 20, it's big red, and your teacher says, oh, you were bad, you had only a bad grade. So failure is something that when it happens, we have a really hard time to go through, because we are wired not to use that to make it better. Um, it's also, failures provide three things, as I said. It's uh, mostly uh, a lack of frustration, failures, frustration, guilt. Uh, I must, I mean, if you have felt you have, at some point, I hope, uh, felt guilt because you just think you didn't try hard enough and you didn't do that the good way. And you will lose confidence and you will, the three items, losing confidence, guilt and so on, the next time you're going to try, you're going to try a little less harder because you failed once. So it's a self, uh, self-realizing prophecy. I don't know if that word exists in English, sorry. Uh, so the first step in facing failures is that just saying that you failed. Because when you failed, most of the time you just try to put that under the table, move away and move on and just yeah, move on and forget about it. But the first thing, in fact, if you want to actually make something about that failure is to just admit it and say that I have failed and uh, you are conscious that you are not perfect and you are conscious that at some point you did fail. I'm sorry, I'm trying to get through the notes at the same time, so I enjoy failing at preparing the presentation I didn't rehearse. Um, so, if you don't face it, you stall. I mean, you stall uh, of what you can do about the failure and it's staying in the back of your mind. I'm sure you've enjoyed experiencing failing at one day and two or three months later still thinking about that failure in another project, in another thing. Uh, and that's something you want to avoid at some point. Uh, second thing is uh, you have to analyze why you failed. And this is critical. Uh, you have to admit it and you have to analyze why you failed. The thing is, analyzing why you failed uh, usually is really hard because you stop at the very first reason why you failed. So if I analyze why I failed at preparing that presentation, uh, the first reason is I didn't, well, I fell at this presentation is I didn't prepare it. And if I stop that, it just means that I didn't prepare it. And next time it's gonna happen the same times. So there is a technique to get to the bottom of that, it is to ask why five times. The first time is to ask why you failed. So I failed preparing the presentation. Why did I fail at preparing the presentation? Uh, because I procrastinated, clearly. I just said, I'm gonna do that tomorrow, I'm gonna do that tomorrow. And on Tuesday I said, hey, I'm gonna do that on Wednesday, on Friday. And then today, oh, my talk is in two hours, I have to prepare. Why did I procrastinate? Because I thought I had better things to do. Why did I thought I, was, I had better things to do? I wanted to have some free time. Why did I want to have some free time? Because I wanted to spend free time with my girlfriend. So this means that if I don't want to fail at my next Wikimedia talk, I should get rid of her. Okay, so that's not a perfect solution. Okay, I agree. Um, I hope she's not gonna watch that talk. She's gonna kill me. Uh, so that's not the solution, but by saying five times why and asking yourself why you failed five times and getting to the bottom, you get to the very core reason of why you failed. And if you do that without having admitting that you failed, you will always keep the part that uh, the reason you failed is yourself. Uh, this is key in a project or in an organization. If you 
fair than an organization and you as you are part of the project you're a leader in the project and you ask you, you ask why we failed the project but you are not admitting that you failed there is a moment when you will ask why and the reason is you you will skip that because you didn't want you don't want to be you um, so asking five times why you get the core reason but when you have the core reason you have to be prepared to make changes so you it doesn't happen again quite obviously I'm not ready to get rid of my girlfriend I pretty much like her um, and I don't want to be single obviously uh, but in many other times you will be able to face uh, the reason you failed and to act on that and if you thought that uh, facing failures and analyzing, a, fa analyzing a, a failure is hard it is not and in fact it's the easy part it's just about getting through a process and saying this is why I failed the hardest part is to move from that and to make changes and changes is really hard we are resilient people I mean mankind as a world doesn't like change uh, Wikipedia doesn't like change. Wikimedians are the worst. They don't like change at all. So when you sum that up, it means that when you want to, things to change, not to fail again, you will encounter resistance, a lot of resistance. And I love the, uh, the previous talk because it's perfect to illustrate that. Uh, we have been demonstrated by A plus B, which is original research, uh, that original research should be reverted back to 2006. Uh, I'm really curious that if it's going to happen in the next 10 years or even two years, uh, because Wikipedians will be against that change. That's going to be the hard part. You will be able to demonstrate brilliantly why this is a failure, why this policy is a failure. I mean, this is brilliant. From the, but from the start to the end, we, I believe we also, why this policy doesn't work? What is it a failure? But will it change? I doubt it, because we are resilient to change, and making a change is really hard. Uh, making things change, um, yeah, uh, making things change is hard because you have to convince people to get into a situation where they are facing unknown and insecurity mostly, uh, and nobody likes that. Uh, if you want to, if you go to the English Wikipedia and says, "Hey, we're going to change original research," the thing that happens is. Everything is gonna go to hell. Everything is gonna be bad. I mean, we're gonna have uh, crackpots coming and uh, saying crazy stuff on Wikipedia because we change original research. And that is the hardest part. We are really resilient people. We are people that don't like to be in a situation where we don't know what's gonna happen and where we don't know uh, what's gonna be next and we are insecure. So when you're leading something that is about, about changing and something that is pretty important, but even small changes in your day-to-day -day life, the first thing you have to do is to, to get people to, get, to feel secure. Uh, to feel, and if it's not to feel secure, to perceive that you know what you're doing. Uh, so, yeah, I am really sorry for this breaks, but I have to go through that. Um, so, the, um, the way you have to make them secure, one of the way is to well, show them what is happening and what is uh, rational beyond that, and then uh, to communicate with them, to talk with them, and to get, through, get them through that. This is the key thing, is to make them secure and know where they are heading, what's next. So we're changing on original research, but what is next? Next is this policy, and this is what's gonna happen. You don't have to say, you cannot say, we will change the policy. It's the end game that is important. The, uh, changing the policy is just the first step. The real thi key thing is about the change in itself. It's the end game. It's what is going to be the end results, the results after a year, two years, three years. And then you have to tell them, to guide them, to take their hand through every step, every small step that's going to be taken for that. Because if you ask them to change the policy right ahead, they won't. But if you tell them, OK, we're going to be a little more um, soft on this little tiny part. It's okay, It's nothing is gonna happen. Look, all the policy is there, we just remove one line. And next time you remove more and more and more, and then you get to the change, you get the end game, but the change is not as, um, as, as uh, uh, frightening as it could be in the first time. Even though you tell that you're gonna change the policy, but you have steps. Um, I'm going. I'm going really quick. 
to what I wrote. So good. Um, and this is a change uh, as well, but when you want to change something and a group is part of it, you have to take into account group dynamics. One people feel insecure facing change. Ten people are scared and entertaining scare, uh, keeping scare, building up uh, among themselves. Uh, and what you need to do is to reassure the group, which is feeling insecure, and this is really, really hard. And in, um, in, in the process of change, uh, you will have many steps, but the first steps will be uh, to deny the need of change, because everything is going okay right now, so we don't need to change. And this is a part that everybody is against the change, and then people will try to uh, resist, sometimes quite violently. And this is perhaps the hardest part, because uh, especially in the organization, when there, this resistance happen, either you convince people that the change is good, and you know the in-game it's good, or you have to remove part of the equation, in many ways, but you have to change the equation because the resistance blocks change. Then you will have people be feeling, starting to feel curious about the change because they have been denying it, they have been fighting it, and you have been, you fought back, you try to reassure them, you change their known by something that they don't know. And they feel curious about that. And then they feel engaged, hopefully, uh, about the change. This is a perfect scenario. Uh, and the thing is, when they engage, you come to the situation where this gets really tricky, is everybody is relieved. We successfully change. We change that policy. We have a new policy which is simpler and more efficient. Everybody is relieved. And six months later, someone comes back and says, ah, if we keep that policy, everything is going to get bad. So we have to have a stronger and more efficient policy. So let's add some stuff. And because everybody is relieved, yeah, OK, we can add some more. We can get, come back from that change. And when you come back from that change, and this is a real risk about change, is it gets even harder then to change things, because people will say, we tried, but then we went back. If any for the reason for getting back was not obvious, it just was someone saying, hey, we should try adding that. Uh, so the, in the process of change, we usually consider uh, we won when we did successfully make the change. But it's even harder after, because you have to make sure that we don't get back to the place we are in the first place. Uh, when you... Uh, when, when that change, uh, when you are in the process of ongoing change, the best thing that can happen actually is that you're facing new problems that needs new change. Because it means that the change has been adopted, that you're facing new issues, and then that you have new issues to resolve. But this is a really good case scenario. I mean, most of the time, either you fail and then you, get, you don't even finish the change and you stu you're stuck with the previous situation and then it's not moving forward and it's not going to move forward for a long time. And I believe we can see that on Wikipedia on many, many topics where we had huge debates trying to change things, fail, uh, change failed, and then we stuck with that for years. Uh, and uh, the other thing is, if you didn't successfully uh, got people to support you and got people uh, reassured in knowing where they're going because then they will not support the change. They will f kind of fight it and in fact it will take much, much, much longer. Even if it doesn't fail to, the, to get back to the situation previously, the previous situation, it can take much longer and damage can be there because you're in a situation where there is even more insecurity. So. Uh, I, I want to make this situation because we are, as a community, we are horrible at facing ch failure and are at making changes. I mean, we have been awesome at making changes. I mean, back in, yeah, until 2006, <laughs> uh, we, we, we were bold. We were changing the rules. We were changing the things. All the, were, all the articles were the rules around the articles and how we edit and so on. And then we started to feel insecure and to try to protect ourselves, to protect the articles. And we stopped facing fellows. We failed in many, many ways, and losing uh, editors or authors is actually a huge failure. Uh, not uh, having uh, more and more and more uh, um, good uh, featured articles is a failure, and we are failing at facing those failures and getting to the bottom of why. Because every time we try to get to the bottom of why, we get to the, th the point where the issue is not organic, is not systemic, it's the people. And it's because of our community, it's because of us that we keep on failing and not facing that. 
if today, I mean, if, if tomorrow suddenly the world community, 100% of, of the community was ready to say, yes, okay, we are failing at welcoming new editors, then it would be really easy to gain new editors because we would have the world community saying, yeah, okay, let's find that, let's find solution, and let's work on that. But right now, what's happening is you have like small little groups trying to find that, and the rest of the community either doesn't caring or even fighting that because it's working. Um, so yes, uh, I think I've done that pretty, pretty really more quickly, quickly, quicker than I expected because I didn't prepare, which is a shame for me. Um, how, time, how long did it take? 15 minutes, I guess. Okay, 20 minutes. So if you have questions to ask the shameful presentation I made, you can. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah. So, if there are a lot of people, you know, saying that your change, you know, they, they don't want your change, might they not be right? I mean, I, maybe I missed that part. You, 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 see, you seem to be saying change is hard, people are, you know, not wanting change. Maybe they're right. Maybe we shouldn't have the change. Okay, so that's why the, f the first thing I said, you have to get to the bottom of failure. And the change comes after you fail. If you didn't fail, so don't fix it. If it's not failure, so don't fix it. But if it's there is a failure, if there is something we are failing at, then yes, you have to change. I mean, if you, I, I don't know, if you fail at work, I hope that you want to change why you failed. Well, you you don't to, just don't want to keep on going. I mean, if a company is losing money, they will want to change and make money. Fair. If tomorrow we lose all our editors, I do hope that we will say we failed and we want to change. That, that, yeah, those are the easy ones that you can change, you can make a convincing case for change, but there are some situations where there's differences of opinion. So, isn't that where consensus is meant to come in? You're meant to find a mid middle ground? Or? But then it's not about failure, it's about opinions. Right. So, uh, like... But people represent, you know, something as a failure, and ask people say, why well, actually this works better without this, you know, it would be worse if it had succeeded. I'm not sure I got that, sorry. You know, like they say, okay, um, maybe we, you know, we're not getting enough um, people who aren't experts or, you know, who are, you know, not very experienced in editing. Would they be better? Would, would Wikipedia actually be better if they if we didn't have those? And, you know, maybe we're doing the right thing by excluding them. So, are we failing at recruiting editors? Yeah. yeah that, that is the question. Perhaps we're not. Sincerely, I'm not sure there's much of an argument there, but if uh, if the you have to define if it's if you fail or not. If you did, if you did, as I said, you need to have a goal. So, what is the goal of having editors? Is it to have only experts, or is it to have as many possible um, as many po people possible? Because we know that in them it's going to be expert anyway. And so, if it's only having experts, do we have enough experts? If we don't, then we fail. And if the second thing is to have as many people as we want, because we know within them it's going to be, they're going to be experts, are we gaining new editors? Yes or no? No, we're failing. But again, as I said at the very beginning, if you want to know if it's a failure, you need to know the goal. If you don't know the goal, you are failing at actually doing anything because you didn't set the goal. What is the goal of having editors? Do we want only experts? Then we are feeling big times because we are all, we have the edit button uh, accessible for anyone. We should have interviews to let people edit. So the the, the real thing is is what is the goal? Okay. And if there is another question, and if not, it's okay. <coughs> Thank you. <laughs> I don't know, you had a question. Yeah, 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 I said thank you for the question, actually. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, just like when you use the word uh, resilience, I think you were looking for the word resistance. Yes. Resilience Definitely. It, uh, just means something. Pardon my French. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I can leave you go outside and have drinks and so on. And I'm really sorry about that. No, I have a question. Oh, thank you, Delphine. <laughs> so, what are you going to change so that this failure of yours does not happen? Um, again, I said what I would have to change, and I will not change that. I don't want to dump my girlfriend. Um, but uh, the first thing would be to check the timetable before the conference, because I was so damn sure it was tomorrow evening. Uh, 
that's it. And well, I, I think it's kind of a tradition at Wikimania to not prepare a presentation before two days, two days before the, the presentation. I don't know a lot of people who does. Okay, drinks? Oh, <laughs> so it's on Chris. Sorry. Thank you, Christoph. Not quite as bad as the Battle of Waterloo, but getting there. Um, so, um, the, uh, those were three really great sessions. Thank you very much to all the speakers who, who presented them. Um, there is one more session in the uh, main hall, uh, starting at 6.15. Then there will be an evening of entertainment uh, in different places in the Barbican. Um, though sadly, this evening is the only one that doesn't come with food and drink included. So enjoy your evening and thank you very much for coming. Therefore, let's do it. Yes. Anyone? Yeah. I was. Anyone can. That's a, that's a good way. Anyone can. It, but I mean, because I honestly think that when we talk about, like, about editor retention and such, I mean, this is not what. This is not something everybody can do. I mean, to some people, the you know, after researching something, writing it, citing it properly, that's uh, something. That is, if, if you're lucky. Some people, they, they uh, forgot that after the age of 15, after, uh, after the age of 18, or after college, when they no longer had to write research papers. Or it's like black magic. I mean, it's, if uh, there was a website which did great things for the world, and you had to factor quadratic poly polynomials or something, I don't think I'd be contributing, even if I liked the results, because that's something that makes me grit my teeth. I mean, in my case, sure, I can do it. But I've gone on to other things. I, I run my own wiki now. I don't, you know, Wikipedia was the starting point, but I found I couldn't do what I wanted to do on Wikipedia, so I moved on. So I, it's the whole gate to the Wikipedia and that, that furry wiki. Um, so I ended up doing something that can be different. So they, I mean, we could be worrying about, you know, worrying, worry, wringing our hands about something that really couldn't change and make you change what Wikipedia is. Well, I, and I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. Yeah, I, mean, I have a sense of situation. I start, started off on Wikipedia, but it didn't quite hold yeah, my interest. Somewhere yeah. somewhere uh, I, don't know, it's, I always got annoyed by Wikipedia. It, you, need to, you need a committee to do anything. Mm. If, if, if whereas uh, on Commons, I can do whatever the fuck I want. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to remember <laughs> that one. What are we I'll, I'll, I'll have to try that, yeah. <laughs> like, uh, but yeah, actually, I mean, yeah, no, no one cares. You yeah. can create this category that you know that isn't harming anything, and yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 the UK trink. Oh, you're Matt Buck. I think yeah. I've given you. I think I've you know reviewed yeah. quite a few of your FPC, your uh, QIC nominees. Quite a for some, uh, Trains, as it would, as it turns yes. out. Yes, I did. It's uh, slightly in the heart, I think. I mean, uh, the. I have, I have a little script which uh, for IRC which d goes through a list of no potential nominations, picks out random ones each day. Yeah. Well. I but think on the train. Have you got a portal for this or something? No, I've just got, just got a text file. Yeah. Uh, so, so, so just uh, listen, I think I've got down to about 1.1 times as many train images as non-train images. <laughs> so I'm getting there. Yeah, well, your train images are good. Yeah. What upload them? Yeah, I'm a shame. Uh, my son isn't around to meet you. He's uh, he's uh, high he's high functioning autistic. He's 16, 
and the YouTube channel that has my name on it is purely, as I'd say, about 99.9. No, it's 99.7% train videos of, uh, of, uh, of commuter rail in the New York area that he's uploaded, and the other 0.3% are videos I took for him. But we might want to head, head out here. Yes, <laughs> yes. In <laughs> fact, when I, I promised him that when I was here, I would take some, I would take some videos of the local trains. And I was able to, I was able to, uh, Tuesday, I think I went up to, uh, I don't know when Tuesday was when I got here. Wednesday, I went up to Macles Field. Mm -hmm. so, yes,